Real quick, before we start this podcast episode, I just want to say thank you for tuning into the Mark Olson Podcast. I know you've got a million things that you could be doing right now, and the fact that you're taking time out of your day to watch this podcast episode truly means the world to me, and I just want to say thank you for that. If you'd like to continue to support the podcast, right below this video, if you could hit the subscribe button, and then hey, if you got some more time and you want to hit the download button, the comment button, the like button, the share button, any of those buttons, it's greatly, greatly appreciated. It helps for other people to find out about the podcast, and it helps for you to be notified about future episodes. So if you guys could take a quick second, hit the subscribe button, I would really appreciate that. Outside of that, this episode and every other episode is brought to you guys by Roast Umber Coffee. As some of you guys know, I co-founded Roast Umber Coffee, and we have the greatest farmers in Guatemala and Honduras and the greatest roaster in Grand Rapids, Michigan, all to bring you guys the greatest cup of coffee possible. So if you'd like to try it out, go to our website, use the coupon code MARK30, and you're going to get 30% off your coffee. Now on to the episode. Thank you guys again for tuning in. Welcome to the Mark Colson Podcast. All right, Kevin, you ready to do this? Let's do it, man. How are you? Good, man. I'm good. Are you rocking a Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, yeah, ripped it off the last uh, Disney cruise with the fam. Uh, <laughs> it was really fun. We went down to Mexico for a few days, and uh, they had Pirate Night and busted out some Pirates of the Caribbean, and I thought it was fitting to uh, drop in here with this one. There we go. There we go. So, um, all right. So, to start off, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Of course. Uh, so, Kevin D. Gods, uh, CEO of Dust Labs, and... Um, you know, working with the team over there at D Labs, uh, ripping out some NFTs. So we got Utes, D Gods, and then uh, all the software that Dust Labs builds. There we go. There we go. So can you tell everyone? Because I feel like you're somebody that like a lot of people just don't know who they, who you are yet, and they've they've started to hear you more in spaces. I feel like the last like few weeks you've been talking a lot more in spaces. Uh, but I feel like for the for the first like few months you were kind of this like mythical creature of like there's Kevin D Gods, but we don't know much about him. So um, can you tell people a little bit more about yourself of like what you were doing before you got into NFTs and working with us labs and whatnot? Yeah, happy to. So. Um been building uh, software companies in the Valley for 20 years, uh, a little bit more than that. Uh, mostly B2B sort of SaaS type companies, um, you know, mostly startups. So start company, grow it, sell it to big company, kind of do it again. And, um, you know, got into crypto early, you know, 10 years ago, again, more as like a enthusiast, sort of really liked the technology, started looking at things and, uh, you know, bought some ICO coins in 2017 during the pump, but again, always sort of had my web two day job. And um, about four years ago, met Frank uh, in a VC's backyard. Um, he, he was in college at the time and I was looking at investing in college kids and, you know, doing angel investing and whatnot and connected with them and helped him and, and his co-founders sort of get into YC and sort of mentored them. They ended up raising 10 million, sort of starting that business. And then during the pandemic, that business pulled back. It was college centric. And, um, you know, a couple of the founders left, including Frank, and they uh, decided to do this NFT project in, in D Gods. And so, you know, I was there sort of when they minted and, and did the first D Gods and have been around again more as an advisor and sort of a mentor at that point and just, uh, you know, sounding board and, and just really connected and vibed with Frank and the team. Um, and then uh, middle of last year, I guess early this year, started to look more at you know, hey, what would it look like to, to try to do something bigger scale? And Frank was always like, hey, let's, let's go do something together and work on something. And I was like, man, like, look, we're, we're, my background is like, you know, running engineering teams and, and large ones and, you know, hundreds of engineers um, working on, on big software projects. Uh, and so I was like, you know, when I looked at crypto, and again, as an enthusiast, I really liked crypto. I liked the idea. But everywhere I looked, there was really only two places where they had tens or hundreds of engineers working on something. And that was either on the L1s, so right, building protocols, building L1s, or uh, building exchanges. And there's obviously, you know, um, exceptions to that, and there's other teams that are large, but those two areas just weren't berries that fit my background and that I knew much about. Um, and as we started with Duppies and Utes, and what, what became Utes, we had this sort of feeling that more and more teams are coming to us saying, hey, can we, you know, use this piece of your website or this tech you built? And for us, that was like an interesting thing because we're like, we'd never thought about building tech for other people. Um, but that coupled with some investor interest really said, hey, what if we, you know, sort of took what we did for DGODs and then what was building for Utes, pulled that into a separate sort of more venture-backed business and sort of just built like a SaaS B2B company for Web3. And both Frank and I, spent a lot of time in, in B2B SaaS companies, me, you know, probably a couple of decades, him, you know, a handful of years. Um, and it's what we knew, right? We'd always been like, how, how do you 
generate interest. And, and one of the trickiest things to do on the SaaS sort of B2B side is get customers, right? Like you can build a great tech, but how do you get awareness at a, at a cost-effective way? And it's expensive to buy ads or do marketing or, you know, find corporate interest and then work through the, the logistics of signing large corporate enterprise customers. And so what we thought we had and what we kind of came up with when we started to talk together was like, look, we could do what we do here for NFTs and really broadly more speaking web three communities and take that software and share it with other entrepreneurs or founders in the space. And if we can do that, we could actually build a large software team to help do this, but also that would bring a bunch of value back to DGODs and Utes holders because now instead of the technology team being a couple of people and a few contractors actually build like tens of engineers working on software, DGODs is customer number one, Utes is customer number two. And then now we have over 10 customers on Dust Lab software feeding ideas and innovation back into that same stack. Um, and, and that sort of was the genesis for the idea of, of Dust Labs, but also kind of like how Frank and I's relationship, you know, over time. So Frank asked me to be the CEO of Dust Labs. We worked together to raise, you know, some funding for that, um, announced that we'd raise 7 million in a seed round to sort of like move forward with Dust Labs as an independent sort of software company. Um, and again, primarily focused on Web3 and communities, but we have this view and vision that, over time, um, more and more Web 1 and Web 2 companies will come into the space and, and need software like this to just make it easier. And uh, happy to go into more details as we get going. But I think, uh, you know, that was the you know, sort of semi-quick story of how Frank and I got connected. No, that's awesome. So I'm actually curious. So you said you guys met initially four years ago. So what was your initial impression of Frank four years ago? Because I know all of us know Frank now, uh, but meeting Frank then, I mean, obviously much younger. Uh, so yeah, what was your initial impression of Frank? I mean, just exuded energy and passion. And, you know, it was one of these events, you've probably been to a ton of networking events, right? With, you know, 30, 40, 50 people, they're passing out hors d'oeuvres, they got an open bar. You know, Frank and the guys were all mostly underage at that time, so none of them were drinking. And so like me, we're just, I, I don't really drink that much. I had like, you know, a glass of sparkling water. And, uh, you know, he started asking me questions about what I was working on and what I was doing. And, and we just got a like really, really high bandwidth conversation. And him and the team, like we just kept getting more and more excited and spent the next hour and a half at this, you know, networking event, really not talking to anybody else, just kind of like essentially off in a corner um, behind, behind, you know, over to the side, just really just riffing ideas back and forth about what they were working on, about my background and what they'd worked on. And uh, it just kicked off this sort of like, you know, what now has been a multi-year sort of like really frequent conversation. And um, for those that are close or know Frank, like, he will just call you at a random time and just, you know, literally just get a FaceTime and you're like, hey, what's up? And he's like, I got this idea and I want to pill you on this. And, you know, just has this like ball of energy that sort of jumps out of the phone at you. And uh, that always just like, no matter where I was in my day or what I was doing, I'd take those calls because every time I picked it up, I just got excited. And, and I felt that passion. I think people that have heard him on Spaces or met him in real life, it's infectious to be around Frank. And um, that to me was always a very motivating factor of like continuing the conversation. And I never felt that I, you know, that it was, it just felt like one of those conversations where every time I talked to him, I was always learning something. I was always moving forward. I was always just more excited at the end of the call than at the start of the call. And, um, I, you know, when, when we finally came to this idea to kind of work together, it was like, well, what, you know, like you always talk about, like you find something that's great. Like, how do you make that your full-time passion in your job? And like, I'd always really been interested in, you know, broadly crypto and NFTs. And this was just a perfect opportunity to sort of like come and do this full on and and work with a team that, you know, just is obviously quite younger than than I, but, you know, is just full of energy. And to me, it's like, I, I've just been excited to like work with the team and I'm constantly just motivated to see them, but also provide my sort of like level of experience of like, hey, we should take our little time here. We should build out the right legal structure, finance structure, HR contracts, and a lot of that stuff that I've worked on and, you know, gave some of that advice, you know, in the early days of D Gods and even their previous startup. And it's, you know, work in progress as we work through that. But to me, the, the part that just, it's that infectious energy of every time, like, you're around Frank, you can't help but just be excited and more motivated to do something. And many times that comes at a, you know, cost of distraction or scatterbrain, you know, sort of like looking around and, and being a little more flippant in terms of reacting. And the part that I always re-level that with it was like, okay, great. Like, from that conversation, like, what do we do next? Like, what is the next best action based on this information? And sometimes it's do nothing. We record that. And um, Bobby, who runs the product and growth for us, you know, has this incredible long list of notion of like this product roadmap. And 
when he joined the team officially, it was awesome because he was like, man, I've been here like, I don't know, it was 48 hours he was in the house with us. And he was like, I've got 25 things I've heard you guys talk about in the last 48 hours. And right now we're only working on two of those. And I think you joked about it. You saw the whiteboard at one point in the early days of youth. We had like 17 steps of like how we're going to take youths from idea to like where it is today. And I think we're on like step 14 or something. We're getting through the, the end of season one for youths and staking and rewards, I think, which we may talk about later is, you know, one of the next ones on there that's coming in soon. Um, but yeah, like I said, being around Frank's infractious, it's incredibly energizing and, um, there's never a lack of new ideas and it's really just about prioritization and how do we like bring those out in a way that's delightful for our holders. So, so my question for you is, did you, cause you're a little bit older without docs in your age. Um, the, uh, I'm in my forties. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. So you're in your forties. Did you have any apprehension at all about like going full in on working with dust labs? Cause I guess my, my thing would be you've, you've had a very, very legitimate, awesome, incredible career. And so was there any nervousness of like, I'm going from like the super stable career to working in a field where it's like, this is all very brand new. Like NFTs have not been a thing that's been around for a long time. Solana NFTs are still very much in its infancy. Um, Dust Labs wasn't even a thing at that point. Um, so was there any apprehension of like, we're, you know, I think everybody's kind of thought for the last year or so we have a global recession coming. So I guess, was there any apprehension of like going all in on this, knowing that like you have a wife and kids and like things like that? And like, was there any apprehension of, I guess, like the uncertainty of this whole space? No. In fact, the opposite. I think, I mean, both my wife and my kids and my daughters would say like, I'm just way more motivated and happier and, and more excited to work on this. And, and that's not the first time that's happened to me, right? I think like if I go back and look at the transitions when I you know, sort of came out of school, we were working on web one, right? This was like the early uh, 2000s, late 90s. And then you know, I presented on stage our product at the time on the first web two conference, right? So I was there, you know, web two summit, you know, it was just called the web two conference before it was called web two summit uh, in San Francisco. And we presented our you know, application at the time that we were working on part of a startup. And there it was like, you know, you're doing this new stuff and you're like, everybody's like, this is crazy, man. You're loading like, literally, I remember we were loading like seven megs of JavaScript into the browser, right? And they're like, that's insane. Like, you're going to break the internet. Like, this is not going to work, right? And then, you know, fast forward 10 years, another startup we were working on at the time was like mobile first. We're like, we're not going to have any web, any web two presence. We're literally, on, our entire company is going to be a mobile app. Like, that's it. And now, of course, we know that like that has been a meta that has run for a decade and been very successful for many companies. And to me, this Web3 thing is a similar transition, right? And, and the, I liken it to this sort of like gr grand vision that we took about is if you go back 20 years, you walk down Main Street, nobody used the internet or their cell phones in their business. You go back 10 years, nobody used social media at scale in their business. And our view with Dust Labs and, and D Labs is that 10 years from now, everyone will use Web3 in their business, right? And that could be for payments, for inventory, for you know, tracking customers, for loyalty, for communications, for marketing. Like there's a whole bunch of aspects and like there's examples of this both on the finance side and community building side that is incredibly powerful. And I think one of the things that hit us last night, we were at an event together here on the beach uh, in West LA. And when we got back to the D God's house after that event, it was literally going to be our team meeting, right? We were going to have our team meeting on the beach and we're like, you know, a day ago just said, Hey, let's throw that on the internet and see if people want to come and got, you know, hundreds of invite, hundreds of RCPs and, you know, a couple hundred people showed up on the beach, like literally with 20 hour notice. Um, and we said like, that's what we're building. Like, that's really what we think is in incredible about web three. How many other things, or businesses or communities where we have a business, right? D gods and D labs are, you know, technically businesses that build JPEGs or, you know, build software where you could, you know, and imagine yourself working at a flower shop and saying, Hey, we're going to have a team meeting for our small business and we're going to have it on the beach. And we want to like, you know, send out a note to our customers to say, Hey, come hang with us on the beach. And you're connected and passionate about our product. And to us, it's like this, you know, this notion of emotional happiness connection to what we're doing with a bunch of like-minded individuals that are quite frankly excited about the ecosystem we're working in, about the products we're working on. And most businesses don't have that today, right? Like this sort of like loyal, distributed, decentralized fan base or customer base or, or just associated related base, right? We have like holders of D-Gods, holders of Utes, holders of Dust, and then just fans of those three. And that 
you know, sort of concentric ecosystem is something that we think the software that we build can really empower businesses of the future to have this sort of direct ownership, right? If you're an owner of a DGOT or an owner of a UTE, or if you held dust, you're an owner in some slice of what we do. And you're voting to like redeem rewards of that of being part of that community, right? And some of those communities are utility, some is just connections in the real life thing. And so for us, as we think about what we're doing and, you know, kind of circling back to your initial question, it was really a, it clicked to me, right? Because I've always felt that, right? I always felt that there was something special about what's happening in Web3 and it's different. It's not figured out. It's ambiguous. Like we spend an enormous amount of money on lawyers and consultants on legal and finance and trying to understand like what is the best way to bring this technology to market for a large number of people, not just like the Web3 DGENs that we all know and love and, and connect with on a daily basis on Twitter and spaces and things like that. But how do we bring this to like, the most, you know, old traditional brands of like web zero, of web one, of web two, and enable them to get the benefits of what we see in web three, right? And again, a lot of it's not figured out, right? A year ago, many of the things that existed don't ex you know, exist now, didn't exist back then. Six months from now, a year from now, we anticipate there'll be a bunch of innovation that happens, hopefully some that we do, and also some that we, you know, sort of watch others do that we can work together to bring this together. So to me, it's that excitement that, is even more multifaceted than the excitement that I felt moving from web one to web two or the excitement I felt from moving from web two to mobile first. And, you know, both, you know, in career and, you know, financially, I've been successful in those sort of transitions, but it's where I like sort of thrive, right? It's not just zero to one, but it's like, it's sort of like undefined to one, right? It's not even zero, right? Zero to one, I think of like, oh, you're starting from like a known place. And I think what we're, doing in web three is much more like undefined to one than it is zero to one. Right. And we have to get to zero, which we're sort of deciding what zero is. And, and like, uh, that, that to me is super exciting. Yeah. I think that's one of my favorite parts about web three is that we're literally like creating what it is. And, and I think that's something that there's very few jobs in this, in this entire world where you have that kind of ability, uh, to truly create what you're, what you're operating in. Yeah. Right. And I think that's something even with myself, like going from photography background to doing this podcast and things like that. And it's like, it's such a crazy thing of, if you told me a year ago that I'd be in the position that I'm in now, I never would have believed it. And now just having the ability to have a conversation with somebody like you and just meeting you months ago and just knowing what your background was and just being like, wow, this is super cool that somebody like you is interested in Web3 and wants to create within it. And like just knowing that we're literally writing the history of it and just thinking about even like how these podcasts are going to age two years from now, five years from now, yeah. when someone's watching this and they're like, holy shit, this is like, I mean, imagine if you had episodes like this of like Mark Zuckerberg from, you know, 15 years ago, like those would be incredible to watch, right? Yeah. And I feel like with people like you, people like Frank, people like Liberty Square and all the other people that have been on the podcast, it's going to be super cool to see like the history of Web3 really being written through um, these conversations, Twitter spaces, everything else, uh, meetups like last night. So uh, yeah, incredibly, incredibly bullish on the future of Web3 and everything that we're building, especially even with like, uh, so I guess I'm curious, have your, um, have your thoughts changed at all with like the current market that we're in? Obviously the last few weeks have been super, super interesting. Um, what do you view like building how do you view building during times like this do you view it as like it's a little bit more difficult to bring uh web two businesses into the space during times like this or how do you view the current market yeah no it's it's great i think and again i keep going dating myself but also i think these are incredible parallels because like the history of technology at least what i've experienced over the last two decades is no different right like we went through the first dot-com crash in the 99 2000 and I was actually working at a software company while I was finishing up college. And, um, you know, th that company, we, we sort of went in on a Friday and the, and the CEO was like, hey guys, here's your last final paycheck. We're gonna file bankruptcy at 5 p.m. Go cash your paychecks, right? And like, you know, sort of like not just game over, but like job over, game over, no severance. You know, you literally get paid four hours of severance and go home. And, you know, but like at the time, like literally was in tears. Like, you know, you were at the bank. We had to go to two different banks because like we all drove to the first one and that one ran out of money. It was a Friday and like they didn't have enough cash to like, because he was like cash the checks, don't deposit them because they may not clear. Um, and so we had to go to a second branch to, for some of us to get our money. And like, and then we went and like, you know, went out together and, you know, drinking and had beers and stuff. And just kind of like, we were like very emotional, right? Because I was like, oh my God, I've never like, like the company blew up in front of us. It was something you were like, it was our life, right? It was like, it was a startup that we were working for. And then, you know, you kind of go through that 
experience and other, you know, sort of downturns, you know, whether 2008 or whatever. And then, you know, I remember when we were building our mobile app company, like we had days where like Apple would ban something that we were doing, right? And the app store would say, hey, this rule's not allowed. You just can't do this. And you, you felt like you were sort of rugged in a sense that like the rules that you thought were assumed and we were building, you know, this particular thing where they're like, hey, this is no longer, a you're not able to do this. You, your app is no longer possible. We had to rewrite a bunch of the part of the app. And at the time you feel like this very gutted feeling of like, it's a very negative and sort of like depressing state. But as I've gotten older and like viewed this and I've read a lot, I'm, I'm a big like uh, reader with Stoic and kind of following a lot of that um, sort of train of thought of like these sort of, you know, the obstacle is the way, like this thing that hits you is really an opportunity to prove your, to yourself and to your team and, and that, that you're, you know, that you can withstand this and, and build through it and, and makes you stronger. And so I think a lot of this with crypto and, again, have, have personally seen, because I've you know, been watching crypto for a decade now, have seen these sort of like bear markets and endured like, hey, the world is ending. Crypto was just a fad. It's going away. And then watch it roar back and then do it again and watch it roar back. And so to me, while the events of this past week with sort of like FTX unwinding and like sort of the fallout of that and FTX Ventures as an investor in Dust Labs and you know, I actually had a meeting with Alameda the night before it was announced and they didn't show up, right? And so like we text them and they're like, hey, you know, we're not really working on that anymore. And then of course the next day it, it sort of unrevealed what was happening. And like, to me, like a younger version of me would have been like incredibly like negatively reactive to that and felt like very like concerned about like decisions I made or what's the next thing. And to me, like, and I wrote a thread on this about like, you just need to, what's, what were you going to do before you heard this news? Is that still relevant and valid? Then just go do that, right? And, um, you know, it's this notion of feed the pigs, right? Like, we, I grew up on a pig farm, and, like, good, bad things would happen. Uh, you know, get a bunch of bad news or good news, and my dad would be like, all right, time to feed the pigs. And, like, you had to feed them in the morning and feed them at night. And, like, that was non-negotiable, right? Like, no matter what, we had, like, a fire one night that burnt through a bunch of things, and everybody was just crushed. And we're like, all right, go back out and feed the pigs. And then the next morning, woke up, and it froze and like all the water, there's no water. And so we had to hand water, you know, 250 sows uh, and all their babies. It was like 400 pigs uh, all by hand with buckets and stuff from like, cause the well and the pipes had broke and like it would feed the pigs. Right. Like, and to me, like I, we had this when we, my, you know, two companies ago, we were getting acquired and uh, we got this huge, like last minute diligence request at like literally 24 hours before we were supposed to close. My co-founders like blowing his mind. I was like, this is insane. And I'm like, no, 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 man. We just got to feed the pigs. Like they gave us a list. Like, let's zen up, just do the list. Like, we know what we need to go do. The emotional reaction is unnecessary and not helpful. And I think for this bear market, when I look at it, as we see things, and it's hard, like it is easy to get emotionally attached to like the price of something or, and again, I've been on the dot-com days where we used to put the stock price on the internet homepage because people were going to Yahoo Finance so often to check the price, they weren't spending their time working. So we're like, let's just put it on the webpage. So like, it's just in the header of every webpage you load. You don't have to load it. It's just there for you and go back to work, right? Um, because you've read the book, like the score will take care of itself. Like we'll watch like an incredible book. It's like, like, look, do the right things. And eventually the score will work out, right? Like the stock price is a lagging indicator that is macro adjusted based on what's happening of like a series of events over time, right? And so it's not a leading indicator of what you're doing now. It's not a current like meter of like whether you did good, good work this morning or this afternoon. And I think crypto prices and, you know, market caps and things like that are not an indication of like, did we as a community do a good job yesterday or today? And because crypto's down or, you know, a particular market actor made a large, you know, you know, change in, in, in what, you know, what we thought is, was like normal, we still have our thesis that I still believe that 10 years from now, Web3 will be in most businesses on Main Street in some aspect. And if that's still true, and those assumptions haven't changed, and we still think that, you know, hey, what we're building on Solana is relevant for builders, we should go continue to build on that. And so to me, like the, these, you know, shifts in sort of business and times, now, do we have to like make sure that we're right size, that the company's not spending, that we have the runway to go through this with like assuming zero revenue, assuming like no new customers, assuming all your current customers go away, you know, assuming costs go up, right? Can you still make it through with a bunch of assumptions? Then yeah, you, you, you should be okay. You should go to work and, and feed the pigs. Um, and so I, I love it, right? Like, so to me, like, I actually thrive with these kind of like, again, situations where like, what we do as builders is find solutions. Sometimes those solutions are technical, but 
most of the time they're not. The technology is an implementation of a solution that we came up with. The solution ends up being something that it was, you know, a problem that you had to solve that is more of a business problem or the way you think about it. Like great example, I'll give a small one that happened two weeks ago when we were building Utes. So everybody knows Utes is out. You know, we've had an incredible like positive resonance with the with this notion of no rarity, right? Like every trait was the same number. Um, there was no saying that the crown was bigger than the hoodie that was, you know, bigger than the beanie. It's all the same. And we let the market decide, you know, what those traits are worth. Um, and historically we had, you know, a trait sort of rarity generator in the code that we used to like generate the rarities, you know, for D gods and dead gods. And you would put in like, oh, this is a mythic trait, you know, half percent. This is a, you know, rare trait, 1%, et cetera. And so for this, we needed to take the 15,000 NFTs and all the traits and say, we needed exactly this number of combinations, no duplicates, no repeating, you know, you know, combinations and, and get them to exactly the same. And we are running this model. And, you know, normally we run it on a couple of computers and it finds the solution in, you know, an hour or two. And we had ran it for a couple of days that we'd been trying. And then we started running it on more computers. We spun up a huge cluster in Amazon to like scale it out to like 64, you know, contiguous threads. And then we're like, hey man, let's, let's go back to first principles. What are we trying to solve here? And we sort of like chill our CTO kind of wrote back out, you know, what it is. And one of our new engineers, you, you know, gentleman used to work at Google and, and then at Pinterest, was like, hey, isn't the problem this? And sort of described it, and he's going to write a thread on it at some point. Well, like, isn't the problem really just matching this and this sort of matrix thing? And literally, he's like, if it is, and everybody's like, yeah, that, that's what we're trying to solve. He's like, oh, well, what if we took this other approach and I'll just be back in two hours? And literally, the dude disappeared for two hours, came back in an hour and 58 minutes and says, here's 10 lines of Python. And here's not just one solution, but like 11 solutions. And there was like 55 million combinations. and things. But it was incredible, right? And like, that sort of like bear market, like, hey, things are down, we're down bad. It's like, there's still innovation happening, right? New things are happening. And so to me, like I always glass half full, like there's optimism, like, you know, as computer technologists, we have to be optimism, right? If like the internet failed or these lights failed or something, we could be like, oh, the world's ending. Or like, oh man, there was a bug. Like that's an interesting problem. How do we go solve it, right? And like looking for all of these sort of like dips or negative experiences as opportunities, to show what we do best, we just come up with solutions, right? And sometimes they're technical and other times they're business or strategic. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's a great example. I love the feed of the pigs mantra. Um, and it's also cool just to hear those stories because I feel like a lot of times when people see like Utes come out, they don't know the background of like the different coding solutions that you guys had to work through in order to find that uh, that solution. And I, I think my favorite part about a bear market is that it forces all of the people who are in this for like quick profits and whatnot to kind of leave the space and go do their own thing. And for everybody else, we're sitting here and like a lot of us, it's like, hey, whether you like it or not, you just kind of became a long-term investor. And so with that, let's all band together let's let's and let's do this and let's really build throughout this entire thing and i've been able to see that with d gods and utes and i've been able to see that with a lot of other teams and it's just really cool to see how i guess like there was like initial day of like panic with everything with ftx and it feels like since then we've had incredible conversation there's been a, it's almost like with the zero percent royalties mantra of like that that whole you know situation it was like the first day everybody was like very angry and frustrated and then the next day it was like everybody was like okay cool now let's focus on the solution right yeah. and so i feel like it's the same thing of like everything going on with FTX, the prices of Solana right now are very similar to where they were last week. But the, like that whole attitude of space has completely changed in the last week because we're like, Hey, whether we like it or not, we're here to build through this. And so now it's just about, you know, in, innovating and continuing to work together to, you know, build ourselves out of this. And I have no doubt that we're going to do that. And so, um, so I want to take it to when you first started at dust labs, what were your initial, like, what were your short term, midterm and like long term goals with dust labs and where you wanted to take dust labs? Yeah, and so I like to think from the super basics, which is like, you know, do we have the proper payroll system? Do we have the proper banks? And so the things that I start to set up is like, you know, very infrastructure stuff. So it's like, who's the CPA? Who's going to be our CFO? We hire outsource CFO. You know, who's going to be HR? How are we going to deal with hiring? How are we going to deal with like contracts and legal? And so I spend a lot of time, and even today I spend, you know, a pretty significant percentage of my time and what would be designed is very operational things. And the team does too. Like the team, you know, when I left the house this morning to come over to see you, like they were working on some secure key storage and things like that, that were like, quite frankly, like over-designed for the fact that we only have a couple guys that own the key, that touch the keys today and a couple ways of solution. But it's creating this, like, we're investing in the sense that like there will be hundreds or thousands of people using this 
just like today, like the infrastructure that we're setting up for hiring and managing and, you know, both roadmap and employees and payroll and things like that are designed for hundreds of people, even though like we don't have hundreds of people on the payroll today. And so I always think about like this point B of like, where are we going and what's the next kind of point B that we need to get to? And um, a lot of times that is not the product or the roadmap, but that's much more setting up the company. So once that's sort of like on its path, in parallel, you're setting it up to like, well, the outcome that you want to reach, you raised a seed around, like that was a milestone of like, hey, creating a, the right team, the right vision, the right timing to, to bring that to investors and to find trust that they're going to partner with you for this first phase of the build. Um, so you find the right partners and you say, okay, well, the next point B we need to get to People are like, well, what's the goal? Like, do you go get acquired? Do you raise like a series A? Like, what is that next point? And I said, well, I don't think about it as a particular outcome. I think about it like creating the most amount of optionality for our team. And so we're capitalized now to, t to have the team and build the team that we've built and to run for several years. And the idea is that at the end of those several years, and as we're working towards that, need to keep, a re you know, reevaluating that we've built several options for ourselves like do we have the right team are we capitalized and do we have you know the right sort of you know monetary ability to feed that team and then do we have you know a vision and a set of customers that are aligned and so when we get to that point you're like well do you have great technology do you have a great team that knows how to build and operate in that space and then do you have the right market share customers or sort of attraction and maybe revenue or not that sort of maps to that and if you can get to that point where you've got revenue coming in that's you know, paying for the team so you're break even or profitable or better, or a growth rate that allows you to consume capital at a rate that acquires customers that are like, hey, in a few years, this is going to pay you back. You create many options. It makes it very easy to keep running the company because you have enough revenue coming in to support yourself. It makes it a lot easier to raise additional capital because you don't honestly need it, right? You're, the capital you're adding is truly growth capital and going to rocket ship you to the night thing. And you're on a rocket with your seatbelt strapped in and you're pointed in the right direction. Because I think a lot of times companies overcapitalize and a lot of that happened in the sort of bull market where people raise lots of capital, but then the rocket wasn't pointed in the right direction. And so sort of like took off and they're like, oh wait, we've spent a bunch of money, but went off the wrong path. And then you see a lot of companies, not just in crypto, but broadly in web two, massively recorrecting. Thousands of people are getting laid off because they overfueled and, and weren't pointed in the right direction or, or, or missed, you know, the arc that they were shooting for. And so I think for us, when we look at it, it's like, hey, have we got a customer base that can support our business that, you know, that enjoys and uses the technology that we have, a team that's excited and culturally aligned with that vision? We have lots of options, right? We can raise more capital. We could, you know, have options on the table to have the company acquired or continue to operate independently because we built a business that we believe in. And so those three options give us the most optionality to pick when we get there. And so I like to think about the things that we do today impacting those options, you know, 24, 36 months from now. Um, and so we're making decisions, you know, and what we're working on now is building a roadmap to pick technology that we think will be relevant to the customer base in the next one to two years that sets up the foundation to be relevant for the next decade, right? And again, you can't just build for the decade. You can't just build for tomorrow. You can't just build for 24 months, but it's making that trade-off of like, how much do you invest in like making the next sale and doing one-off work versus building something that repeatable that's going to make the next 10 sales versus building something repeatable enough that enables you to make 100 sales. And that sort of like balance is what I spend a lot of time on with the team and, and talking through like, what are the pieces that we need to go on each of those facets to sort of walk down that path? So, so you talked about customers there for a second. So for, for Dust Labs, for your customers, are they primarily like other NFT projects that you think are going to eventually want to use your SaaS products? Or are you talking more about like Web2 businesses coming into Web3 and then having SaaS products set up for them to get started in Web3? Yeah, great question. It's both, right? And, and honestly, when we talked to investors and had the initial business plan, it was very much so we're going to sell to NFT creators, right? Like, and then we sort of like realized that we need to zoom out a bit and that a lot of our, our first customer was Honeyland, right? It's a web three game. So like it, NFT creator is not probably the right way to describe them. Those guys are an incredible team. Corey and guy have built this game that is pretty immersive and is really more of a crypto game, right? Or a pay to earn, play to earn type game than it is like an NFT project. And so, you know, then we're like, well, you know, Dust Labs is building for web three creators and web three communities. 
But then, you know, ASICs came to us and we did, uh, you know, deal with ASICs. They had a shoe that launched during Breakpoint, the Solana shoe. And we were the CM, CRM behind that. And so for us, it's we've already reached what we thought was like a year two thing, which would be selling into web one and web two brands. But these brands, you know, the, the gentleman that we sold to at ASICs, you know, is head of web three at ASICs, right? And so like, there's already these web two companies that are forward looking and forward thinking. And we see more every day. We see it in the press, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal is constantly talking about this company's launching something or this company's doing something in web three. And uh, so we're, I would describe us as today selling to primarily web three communities. And then, you know, as makes sense, web two communities that have already decided to do something in web three, we're not yet at the point where we're going to like the pure web two business and like pushing a solution into them. It's like, Hey, go web, go use web three in your business. But we think that, you know, that's sort of the goal to reach that over the next 24 months. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. And yeah, that, the news with ASICs was super cool to see. Um, and I also feel like times like right now, um, it's the better time for web two businesses or web one businesses to come into web three, because when you come in in a, in a like peak bull market, it, it, you really have nowhere to go, but down. Right. And so with this, it's kind of like we're in a position where there's nowhere to go, but up. Right. Yeah. And so that's a better position, if I'm being honest, like for a Web2 business to come into Web3 um, where you have more upside than you do downside there. And I think that's an exciting time. And also just attention, right? In a yeah. bull market, there's like a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people are like, if you looked to break point a year ago, it was very bull and very like, very like up, right? Everybody was like, oh my God, everything's running. And, you know, break point this year was really about builders. Like, what are you working on? The conversations were more, you know, technical in nature and solution in nature. And less about like, hey, let's just party like everything's going good. And I think like we need both. But um, but you're right. Like it, it's time in the market. It really favors people that are building solutions and willing to sit down and listen and favors companies that still believe that Web3 can bring something to their business in the near term. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. So one of the common questions people bring up all the time is obviously dust, right? Yeah. It's in the name Dust Labs. It's obviously like kind of the uh, lifeblood of D-Gods and Utes and whatnot. And so can you kind of explain, I guess, um, I, I know that it's hard to talk about some of the forward thinking things with dust and whatnot, uh, but can you talk about, I guess, like how dust is utilized within Dust Labs and kind of where you see dust, uh, I guess, being utilized moving forward? Yeah. So I think dust uh, as a protocol, the dust protocol, we have integrated that into many of the things that we've built, right? You saw this with the initial um, D God staking, then dead gods transcending, you know, was in dust, increased the amount of dust that you earned. Utes mint was entirely in dust. And um, those are things that we've built, you know, that are, you know, came from the genesis of the dust labs team at the time they were working as part of D labs. And now as we looked out on the community, like those things look like small things in the broad scheme of things. Cause there's, you know, tens or hundreds of integrations of dust, depending on how you count, right? There's lots of, you know, payment gateways and payment protocols that have integrated dust, raffles, you know, famous foxes doing trading, like all kinds of cool degen picks. There's just a bunch of cool stuff that people have integrated dust, selling dust. You know, you can go buy, you know, coffee or you can buy, you know, merch in dust, right? And so for us, you know, our sort of goal was to make sure that like, this thing had an organic sort of like self-fulfilling community around it. And Dust Labs will continue to build things for that. Like we have like a, the floor bot that when royalties were on, we would refund a percentage of your royalties either from 30 to 300% back if you bought the floor, right? And so it doesn't make sense to bring that to market right now. Royalties are sort of not enforceable in a broad sense. But we think once royalty enforcement comes back here in the coming weeks, that'll be a really cool, you know, sort of widget that we can apply and, and either give to other creators or, you know, charge other creators, depending on how we decide to bring that to market, where they can use that and it allows them to integrate the benefits of Dust and that community, right? Like, I think the thing that we think is one of the coolest things about Dust is that we didn't, you know, create that community. That community grew organically and, like, you know, you have D-God holders, you have Ute holders, and you have Dust holders, right? And like, and I draw the picture in that sense is that there's many more Dust holders than Utes holders, many more Utes holders than D-Gods holders. And we expect that sort of symbiotic relationship between the three of them to continue. Um, and again, can't give a bunch of forward look at states, but we do have some really interesting things that are going to happen with staking and rewards. And Dust will be a really key component of that uh, and a really fun component of that. And uh, we expect to, you know, be able to bring more of that to light when staking comes out here in the coming weeks. And um, we're pretty excited about the future there. But more importantly, what I've seen, and I think this is a, a telling example, is that I get a lot of DMs and requests of people that are founders or builders to say, hey, 
Kevin would love to help you have you guys help me, you know, do this thing with dust, or integrate dust. And I'm like, oh, you don't need our permission. You can just do it. And surprisingly, I would say more than half of them don't even know that. They're like, what? I, I, I can just add dust? And you're like, yeah. And what's cool is that I think the DJs kind of got it first. Like the DJs went just and did this. They just started doing dust and the D gods holders are, you know, sort of this, a bunch of goaded builders. You can go to D builders and see like the hundreds of projects that have been built around, you know, from the D gods sort of like holder base. And a lot of them have integrated dust into that. And so when I, when I tell like founders of companies that are maybe they're VC backed companies, or maybe they're just projects that weren't aware of the original sort of genesis of D gods and dust that they can just go build for that without our help. And we're happy to advise them if they need it. Um, it's pretty liberating, right? And uh, they realize that they get that marketing and sort of ecosystem of benefit of like, oh, there's already like, you know, 100,000 wallets that hold dust. And you're like, yeah, you guys can just go integrate with those. And a lot of those, you know, as you know, that the genesis of those holders are people that were already affiliated with D-Gods and Utes. And, and we know that those are being two of the most popular sort of NFTs on the Solana kind of creates dust as this most popular SPL token tied to, the, to an NFT. And uh, yeah, so so we think it's we think it's a very organic relationship, but Dust Labs is going to continue to build things that sort of enable additional utility, but more importantly, ensure that it's easy and the and the, and the token's set up so it's very easy for anybody to sort of leverage it and use it. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. So when you guys are thinking about like use cases of Dust, do you guys think about like a bun like a larger variety of like smaller use cases of Dust or like big uses of Dust like uh, like Utes when it was minted all in Dust? What, how do you guys view that? No, it's a great question. And, and we talk, it's something Frank and I talk a lot about with the team. And uh, we think the, the future of dust is best served by lots of little decentralized things, right? So that's organic use cases of people bringing it into payments, people bringing it into rewards, people bringing it into like, you know, redeemable sort of raffles and fun giveaways. But it would be much better to build 1% more usefulness for dust every week then it would be to sort of like, hey, there's this 30% use case, 30% use case every six months. And so we're much more in the favor of like, how do we continue to add incremental use cases for dust? And then that sort of those use cases bring more people into the ecosystem. And then that ecosystem attracts more builders. And, um, you know, one of the things Frank's talked a lot about in spaces and sort of workshop this idea of like the dust VC. It's like, if you have a thousand dust, you're a venture capitalist in dust. You can sort of like, you know, give a grant to a builder or vote with your dust in terms of what you would do. And one of the things we would love to bring to the, the DAO is this notion of like, is there a way that we can have like projects present themselves in like a shark tank type way? And I know you've done a bunch of product reviews and you've been on a bunch of, you know, panels and like have folks like you and other keep folks in the space sit on these panels and be like, hey, like have people pitch their projects and then you can sort of from the dust foundation go and grant it. And maybe it's like ZK Shark and other people that are really like, you know, thought deeply about the different products in the space and what's necessary to have startups or like builders pitch and actually get grants of dust. And so that's something we're so excited about, which I think aligns more with that. Like how do we build like small incremental, but like highly diversified use cases for dust across the ecosystem rather than us you know, building large things where it's like, hey, we're going to do another mint and dust. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense because I feel like when you when you think about it like that, um, it's so much easier to make a bunch of like small use cases rather than like everybody waiting for that one like massive drain of dust, right? And I think that's kind of where it's been the last like probably, you know, four or five months where people are like, okay, we're waiting for the next like major use case, right? When in, in reality, if there's a bunch of different use cases of dust, then dust just becomes inherently more valuable because it's utilized in more ways. So yeah. that makes sense. So One of the interesting stats that we look at on that note is like, the number of programs and the number of addresses interacting with dust, right? And I think as you start to, as long as you see that activity grow and you see the number of active wallets transacting in dust continue to grow over time, we think that'll be the healthiest thing for the dust ecosystem. And to do that, it's lots of diverse use cases because some people may want to do DGEN picks. Some people want to do raffles. Some people may want to do over-the-counter trading. We don't know, but not every person is going to use every use case. And we think having that smorgasbord of use cases, smorgasbord of rewards is the best way to have broad-based usage. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, okay, so you talked about uh, Dust Labs, and, and it's been mentioned, I believe, in, in Twitter spaces and whatnot, that Dust Labs is currently profitable. Am I right on that? We are. The first two months we were profitable. Uh, we don't expect that to always be the case. I think uh, when you think about it from a, you know, sort of bookings and revenue, we've sold hundreds of thousands of, you know, contracts and software. 
And, uh, you know, we expect those as those convert to revenue over time to continue to drive. Now the team's grown significantly from them from those first couple of months. And so, you know, the idea of raising enough funding for several years of runaways that you can t spend the time to uh, invest in the team and uh, build out a team in a way that you can build for the future. And so, you know, most venture backed companies don't assume that they're going to be profitable. I think we were delightful to see that in the first couple of months, but we expect that to, you know, do some investment of that funding over time to then build back to a place of, of sustained revenue. Yeah, no, so that makes sense. So then when it comes to like the investment into Dust Lab, so I feel like a lot of people, it's been probably one of the more common questions of people not necessarily understanding like what that that investment, what that raise was for, right? So that raise was for Dust Labs. It's not for D Labs, which holds essentially Utes and D Gods underneath that. It was for Dust Labs. So can you give the rationale for why why you guys did a raise for Dust Labs versus D Labs? Yeah, I mean, and we've seen this in the space. We've seen other, you know, large projects like Yuga or Moonbirds and they raise, you know, VFriends, they raise on the brand. They raise on the NFT project holistically. And when we looked at that, you know, Frank felt really passionately about the NFTs and the community around the NFTs being the primary customer. Like the holders are the end-all be-all of what D-Labs needs to do. Like D-Labs is set up to serve the customer and those customers or those holders are really owners, right? And we didn't feel that it was right to bring investment into the art and NFT side of the business or sell the brand. Because quite frankly, the, the funding does, it's not, it's not a capital intensive business to build a great community. Like, you know, we had this party on the beach last night. We probably spent less than 200 bucks on it. It was some firewood and uh, some, you know, cases of water, right? Like there wasn't a lot of, you know, to have, to, to bring in a great event together for hundreds of people. And so when we look at that, we thought that like, and a lot, a lot of the crypto VCs and a lot of the ones that like had followed D gods from the beginning were really excited to talk to us because they thought that they were investing and wanted to invest in those projects. And we were like, look, if you're investing in the NFTs, you can just go buy them on the market, you know, go sweep the floor. Right. And so, and some of them did, we saw that happen in the early discussions, but I think the, for us, it was more important to like build a venture backed business that made sense to us, which was like this B2B SaaS, very investable, the cap table of that Dust Labs entity looks much lower like a Silicon Valley startup where we felt the D Labs, you know, sort of entity is much more as a service to the holders. And so for us, we didn't want to raise in the brand. We could have raised at a much higher valuation if you would have took the collections. I mean, at the time, D Gods and Tubes were worth, you know, collectively several hundred million dollars. The raise would have been, you know, upwards of a billion kind of like valuation. Like it was a very expensive, um, you know, sort of like, offer that would have come through if you would have raised on the brand. But we just felt that that wasn't aligned with what we needed. Um, and again, we didn't want to raise too much capital, but also really didn't want to, you know, dilute the brand. We really wanted to keep that brand and the holders aligned. And uh, the holders are the, the, you know, the sort of both owners and customers of what D-Labs does. And there's no other constituent, right? There's not, you know, a VC or another owner that's, you know, staking a claim and saying, hey, you need to go do this with the project or the project needs to work this way. There's no other influence. Like, you know, the D Labs team and Frank, you know, live and die by like, are the holders happy? And are they feeling that we're adding value and building with a solid roadmap of the collections? Yeah, that makes sense. So, so then what was the, the main purpose, I guess, behind the raise for Dust Labs? What did you guys view that, that money being used for? Has it been utilized at all yeah. right now? And I guess, where do you see it being used in the future? Yeah. So, I mean, in the early, like I said, the first couple months we didn't use any, we like said had enough customer revenue to sort of cover the initial costs. Um, now we're obviously starting to spend a little bit as we hire the team. So it's really to hire a team, right? I mean, hiring first class engineers from, you know, really reputable web two companies, you know, Facebook, Google, Pinterest, et cetera. Um, that 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 costs money, right? And we wanted to bring in that level of talent um, to fund Dust Labs innovation to go build out technology that's going to last for a long time and, and really serve our customers and allow us to scale much quicker, right? It also feeds back in that the ability to invest in building that team better serves D Gods and Utes, which are the first two customers of everything that Dust Labs builds, but also the marquee you know lead generation. When we launch something for Utes or D Gods. And at the bottom of it, we have a link, hey, contact us to apply. Like when we launched Ute List or scholarships, we had over 2,000 leads come in of other projects wanting to use Ute List and scholarships, right? And so far, we've talked to a couple hundred of them and probably brought, you know, around 20 onto the project, onto the, you know, onto the road, or, you know, as customers onto the, onto the customer base today. But that notion of like being able to use D-Gods and Utes is like this marquee sort of like, you know, 
expose of what we've done and to prove that it works. And if things don't work, we don't get a lot of leads or it doesn't work in the meta, we try something else, right? And this notion of being able to like very rapidly prototype and experiment and sort of like test at scale because we're not testing on a small unheard of project. We're testing on, you know, two of the biggest projects in the Solana industry or in the, you know, in the Solana ecosystem. Um, and so like that, that is the alignment of how we think the two work together. Um, and that investment will allow us to accelerate building a strong technology team, but with a, with a vision that that technology is not just used for DGOT and Utes, but like any web three community and over time, any like web two or web one business. That's very cool. That's very cool. So I, so I know that, um, you know, one of the other common subjects in the last uh, week or so has been the, the fact that FTX uh, Ventures was an, an investor into Dust Labs. So did that affect anything, I guess, in, in the last week or so? Did you guys already receive that investment? And then, I don't know, is there any other thoughts on, I guess, like the um, use of, of uh, FTX investing into Dust Labs? Yeah, so FTX was a minority investor uh, in Dust Labs. The money was in the bank already been transferred so there's no like outstanding thing that they owned it wasn't a line of credit it was like purely an investment that came in when the round closed uh, a month or two ago and so we're not expecting any other changes there none of our funds were custody in ftx um we happen to use ftx not in dust labs but in d labs as, as a fiat to crypto bridge but um, we never held funds in that. Um, and so, yeah, all of our funds in crypto are held in multi-sigs that we control. And then we have U.S. bank accounts where the uh, USD is held. That makes sense. That makes sense. And so I guess w another question about Dust is that um, will Dust be, I guess, like required for anybody who wants to work with you guys, whether it's a Web2 business uh, wanting to work with Dust Labs or another NFT project wanting to work with Dust Labs? Will Dust be, I guess, utilized in that transaction? If I guess like if you're not... I don't know if you can give the details of all of that, but like, will that be utilized in some way? Yeah, so the, currently the software that we sell, we take USD or USDC. So um, some of that comes in in Seoul if it's a percentage of mint, um, depending on the deal. So we don't require dust to be used. Like if somebody was to like offer us to dust or wanted to pay in dust, we'd absolutely accept it. Um, but our general model has been that less around building dust as the payment mechanism for everything we do and more integrating dust into the applications that we build and the ecosystem. Like we'd much rather see, you know, dust be integrated into our staking and rewards platform, you know, rather than trying to say that, hey, like to move on to that platform, you have to have dust. I think we think that that's a better way to price it. We've seen a lot of companies in the crypto space try to price something in their token. And then as that token moves or it changes the market, it ends up being tricky for that you know, individual company, especially a Web2 company that's not used to paying that way and seeing like the price of their good change over time. Um, we felt that, you know, pricing stuff in USDC and USD and then on the back end, converting a percentage of that into dust is a better model. And so that's the model that we've picked so far in terms of how we're going to operate. But, you know, open to change it. I think we, there's nothing that, um, you know, is tied us to that model. And we're really early. Like, I think, we're still discovering how pricing is going to work and how the model is going to um, evolve over time. And so we definitely are open to like figuring out different ways to sort of like monetize what we're doing. Um, you know, it's sort of finding product market fit and looking for the solution is, is more of the challenge than saying, hey, we're going to absolutely have to do it this way. Yeah, uh, I mean, if there's anything that we know, there's a constant thing in, in the space has changed. So yeah. uh, that makes sense. And so, it makes it fun, right? Yeah. Like if we were stuck in a centralized set of rules, we would have less room to sort of innovate. And so for us, we think that ability to change and react to the market and what the meta is saying is, gives us a lot of flexibility and just quite frankly, it's more fun to build solutions that way. Yeah, very true, very true. So so you talked about uh, using some of the uh, the venture funds that came in to essentially to bring in new hires for Dust Labs. So what kind of people are you guys looking to bring into Dust Labs? Yeah, so I would say today it's primarily been technology. So mostly engineering. So we've hired like DevOps, security, uh, you know, Rust engineers, uh, engineers working on like sort of what looks like a lot of classic Web 2 stuff. Because a lot of things we build, I would say 85% of that's Web 2. You know, you think about like with de database, website, JavaScript, you know, 5% of that is connecting to a wallet on the front end of the browser and then 10% talking to the blockchain. Um, so a lot of Web 2 sort of skill set. Um, folks that are focused on high scale, right? So building SaaS applications for hundreds or thousands of customers, you know, I think the, the guys that came from Google and Facebook have experience building large consumer sort of shared um, resource type models, which is really, you know, advantageous to what we want to build on the consumer side. Um, but yeah, I think like, you know, product designers, UX designers, things of that nature, really product people, right, at, at heart um, and builders, I, I think is 
the way to look at it. And I would say that, you know, the, the majority of the people that we've brought on have worked in other, you know, industries, but also in broader software companies that have that experience. So it's not just sort of the web three D gens, but sort of a wider sort of audience of uh, folks that have had experience building software solutions for both enterprises uh, or like sort of consumer use cases. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I know uh, you have a tight time schedule, so we only have yeah. a few more questions, but uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on NFT projects becoming more multi-chain or cross-chain. Um, what are your thoughts on that overall? Yeah, I mean, the ETH thing's been a topic. I think, you know, Frank would admit it, but both of us now that, you know, his sort of like, hey, we're going to ETH or, you know, sort of dropping some, you know, alpha or sort of, you know, his thoughts on like ETH because we were hearing a lot from our community during the early days of the FTX issue. Um, but the way I like to look at this is like, I don't think of it as like a move or a migration. Dust, has, Dust Labs has always been thought of and vision as like a Web3 company. We're building software agnostic of chains. We have customers that are on ETH. We obviously have a lot of customers and attention on Solana. Um, you know, Mistin Labs is an investor in the company. So like, you know, we, we deeply feel that like other chains will have their use case in the ecosystem. And for the right use case, the right business, like we want to build software for Dust Labs to support that. So from a technology point of view, we're much more interested in building great UX and having the right solution for the end customer than worrying about the chain. On the NFT side, which I think where a lot of the questions and a lot of the topics come up with, is if you think of what we've built on Solana and achieved over the last year, is we have the top two or three collections, you know, if you include tubes as a collection as well, from market cap volume floor price perspective. And there's not a lot of room to take more market share, right? Or grow much. Because we've literally at times been 70, 80, 90% of the market share on a given day on, around volume. And so when I look at ETH or, you know, Avalanche or Aptos or Cardano or whatever, to me, all of those are obvious places that over time we want to expand into. And so I think for us, it's about how do we expand the expertise that we have both on the Dust Labs and DLab side to bring these NFT projects or bring our software to other chains. And just like on Solana, when we build for Utes and DGods, that is the best way to sort of prove that we've built great stuff from Dust Labs. And so we think if we're going to go build for ETH, having a collection or having some experience building on ETH with our own collection will be the best way to validate our tools, but also prove that like we've built the right tools to build really strong Web3 communities on other chains. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, and then going back to Dust Labs for a second, um, who do you guys view as like, do you have any big competitors that you view as, or do you view it as like, we don't really have competitors, we're just focusing kind of on our own lane? Yeah, I mean, it's always funny when you think about competition as a startup, because you could squint and decide that any company is your competitor if you really want to get narrow enough. Oh, this company's competing against me, this company's competing against me. And so I think one of the challenges that startups have, and I've seen young startup founders and some of that I've invested in and mentored over time fall into this trap of like, oh, this competitor's doing that or this person's doing this product or they're knocking our stuff off or they're adding a feature that we added first or vice versa. And over focusing on that, most startups die because they run out of money or they run out of energy. They don't die because the competitor actually beat them, right? And so when you're a small company, the world is your oyster. Like you have all of Web3, all of Web2, all of Web1, the entire internet is your customer. Much more focus on like, how do you grow the pie of what you're doing and the interest and value in what you're building versus thinking about like, oh, it's this customer or that customer or this client or this competitor is building something. Because I, I just, I mean, yes, there's competitors out there that are doing what we do. Could somebody else have built the things that we built for ASICs? Could somebody else have helped Honeyland with what they needed to do their last mint? Absolutely, right? But I think for us, coming from a space of strength on the NFT side and proving that we've we've walked in the shoes of these, you know, our customers, right? We've had to build things to build for our community gives us the credibility to be the right partner for a subset of people in the community, right? And our view is that we want to increase that subset to be larger. And so, yeah, I think for us, it's really about, you know, less looking of like, who's our competitor and thinking that like, we as Web3 need to just grow and all of us that are in the Web3 space need to figure out how to 100X or 1000X Web3. And that will still be a far cry from what Web2 and Web1 is or other brands today, right? Um, so yeah, there's competitors. I, I could try to name specific ones and talk through like who's building, but you know, anybody building in Web3, I think is a, is on the right track and they're early like us and we're excited to sort of find our niche and just grow the pie versus like thinking about, you know, this scarcity mindset of like, how do we get more from like a certain fixed area? 
Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so I have one last, like, super broad question I'm going to ask you, and then I definitely think we need to run this back uh, as soon as you can, because I think we just need to get this going. I think people are going to love this episode. But I have have two questions. I'm going to just morph them into one, and you can just answer this to end it. So can you first talk about your relationship with Frank, and then what, I guess, each of you brings to the table that the other doesn't, and kind of how that that relationship coexists? And then at the end of that, can you take that into what makes you super bullish on D-Gods and Utes and Dust uh, for everybody who's listening who may be a holder of one of those um I, yeah i guess a uh, super broad question but we only have a few minutes no i love it it's a good one and it's a perfect one to finish on so thanks i think my relationship with frank is continues to grow in a, in a really positive way and um like i said he energizes me i mean he wakes up at a you know we work different hours you know frank generally works 10 11 a.m sometimes noon till 5 a.m or 6 a.m right so for him like he sort of is ending work when I'm waking up and heading to Barry's in the morning, right? So I'm heading out at, you know, 4.45 or 5 to go to Barry's uh, and Frank's just kind of winding down spaces. And I think there's a lot of times when I'm in San Francisco. So I spend a week in LA and a week in San Francisco on most most months. And um, when, I, when that happens, like a lot of times he'll be on a space and I'll be waking up at five in the morning and he's been grinding for hours all night. And we kind of have this sort of handoff um, and literally can almost interchangeably switch off words and, and take off in a new direction. And so that part of it's really cool to sort of almost have this follow by follow the sun model, right? In terms of how we work. Um, I think the thing that Frank's great at, and it's this sort of passion and deeply emotional connection to hearing everyone and trying to make everyone happy in a, in a, in a fan type. So he's like, he sees holders and sees this meta and like, really wants the best for the community and the best for our companies um, and takes that to heart. So he really has an empathetic, like deep understanding of what it feels like to be a holder and what it's like to be in the community and has this incredible pulse on what's going on. And, you know, he's always like, this is what I'm hearing or this is what I'm seeing. And there's no one else that spends the time and energy that he does interacting with so many individuals across the space that I continue to learn from. So he can condense weeks of spaces and weeks of time on Discord and in these communities into a couple hour quick hit with me where he's like, dude, these are all the things we need to go do. Um, And then what I, I think, excel at is being able to listen and synthesize with that and trying to lay that into a roadmap that we can go execute against. And so a lot of times, you know, even last night at the beach, He's like, dude, I got to pill you on something. I just came up with this idea. And we, you know, stepped aside for a few minutes and we talked a bunch about this idea of financing this new project we're working on. And, you know, it was good, right? Because like when he has an idea, he wants to share it and he wants to pill me on it. And, and I'm incredible at listening and then I can go, okay, cool. And then what I'm hearing is these three things. And this morning we like laid those two plans on and we go execute it. And so I think for me, it's this more methodical approach of company building and solution building over time that, you know, I enjoy doing, I enjoy feeding the pigs. I enjoy that rhythmic view of like, what's the next thing? How do we go achieve it? What do we have to achieve by tonight? Okay, that was good. What do we have to achieve by tonight? Okay, that was cool. What do we have, you know, bringing it back to like, what is it that we're going to do to ship and how are we going to make what we ship incredible? And then I think as you think about what that is for holders and how that impacts what I think is the quality of what we've achieved over the last few months versus let's say at the first few months of D-Gods a year ago back, a lot of the technology things that we released broke the internet, but also broke themselves, right? Like we would release something, Mint wouldn't work, password was wonky on the Mint. Then it's like, oh, the Dead Gods thing, site went down, wedge thing. When we did the Mint of Tubes, we had all this like, you know, bots hitting the thing and and wedged the site. And then if you look at the release of, you know, Utes and the art reveal and the and the drop side and then the mint side and then the explorer and the and the leaderboard and now you know rewards and staking it's in the menu you know what's coming next those technology releases have been nearly flawless from our point of view especially compared to our last you know previous ones that were different and I think because of that it builds higher trust in the output of what we do which then when holders see that and non holders kind of like wanting to come into the community. They see that we're building stuff and we're improving over time and we're learning and we're saying what we're doing and doing what, we're, what we say. And I think to me, that's probably one of the best values that we can add as Dust Labs is because if we prove that our technology is stable, you know, secure and delightful from a user experience, like, man, I still like, 
I love watching videos or even remembering my own time when I minted my tube. And you put that tube in there and you click it and you see that thing fall down and the music starts. It was a delightful surprise, right? And I think that quality of polish, we want to have the community expect and we want to continue to raise the bar on ourselves to achieve that level of delight. Because we know that that's good for our communities and our holders, but it's also good for customers of Dust Labs in the future, which then feeds back into like Dust Labs becoming a bigger engineering team and a bigger solution space so that we can build more things for D-Gods, more things for the holders of Utes and more things for the holders of Dust, right? And so this, we called it the Dust Flywheel when we drew it out for the investors. And it was this idea that the more successful D-Gods is, the more successful Utes will be. Both of those will drive success to, to dust. The more holders of dust drives more success into being holders of the Genesis projects. And then the more success of all three of those feeds you know, attention to dust labs, which allows dust labs to get more customers. And then those customers you know, paying dust labs grows and scales our business, which then allows us to build even better and more technology for D gods, youths and dust, right? And so it's like this really symbiotic relationship that we're excited about. And it's pretty unique because you know, when you talk about competitors, I think there's a lot of competitors in the NFT space. There's lots of competitors building stuff for NFTs. There's lots of competing tokens. Um, but I think the symbiotic relationship that we've built and the rather simple mechanisms, like there's not a lot of like interesting or, convoluted relationships it's very simple right we build technology for nft projects nft projects build great communities that are strong and, and loyal and uh and passionate about what we're doing which makes them fan of the token which makes them fan of the software company which then feeds that flywheel again and so i'm most excited about the mechanism and sort of like the multiple ways to win that we've created as a sort of an ecosystem and we feel you know indebted but also emotionally aligned with the holders of every asset right whether you're holding d gods you're holding dust or holding utes doesn't matter or you're an investor holding equity in dust labs we're all on the same team and to me that makes it exciting to go out to market and again we're competing with growing the mind share of web3 and less competing with any individual nft project while we talk a lot about flipping board apes and we're gonna you know build this incredible collection on eth and we are like, we're, we're coming, like, we're going to go do that. Like, and we're pumped to do that. Um, but it's more important about that journey of how we do that in a way where along that journey, we have a bunch of fun. Cause like, man, like we got to smile more. We got to just be delighted to be here. Um, Cause holy shit, like what an incredible like time to be alive and what an incredible time to be working in this space. Um, and so I, I don't let that get lost on me or the team. Um, but yeah, I, I think the relationship of the way these things work together and the idea that no matter what happens or what changes, we have, um, we may not have an answer, but we have a path to a framework, to a solution. And I think that's to me where I think a lot of projects or point solutions don't, right? It's like, hey, you can build this incredible technology, ton of funding, but you don't have enough users or popular NFT projects or Web3 communities to prove it out. Or, you know, you have a great NFT project, but it doesn't have like an ongoing roadmap or builder sort of like driving attention. You have an incredible Discord or Twitter, but you don't have technology innovating and building towards it. Uh, you don't have a path to additional collections or additional utility. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you look at that sort of relationship between all of those, I think that's what just makes me the most bullish on what we're doing and why I'm so excited to, you know, have a small part in this team and to get to work with all of you and, you know, all as holders, but also, you know, sort of, you know, influencers in the space and whatnot to sort of like continue to learn and just grow together. Yeah, I'm, hey, I'm excited. That's a great way to end this episode. Kevin, this has been a pleasure. I'm looking forward to round two because I know we're going to have to run this back very soon. Uh, but I just want to thank you for coming on today. Uh, and I know uh, there's, I have a lot more questions, but we only have limited time today. So we're going to run it back soon. Um, but I appreciate you doing this. I'm excited for the future of uh, D God's Utes and Dustin. So let's fucking go. Let's fucking go. Thank you, sir. No problem. All right, see you soon. See you guys.